And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to virtual Grand Rounds uh, at the Houston Methodist Kabanke Heart and Vascular Center. I'm very pleased today to have the second part of our series on COVID-19. And today we have actually a panel of critical care physicians uh, led by Dr. Faisal Masood, who's going to give us an update on the uh, critical care management of patients with COVID-19. So uh, let me start off by introducing Dr. Masood, and then I'll let him introduce the rest of his panel. Uh, Dr. Masood is the medical director uh, of critical care at Houston Methodist Hospital, and he's the chair of the quality and patient safety. Uh, he's also a member of the board of directors of the Houston Methodist Hospital. He's a professor of anesthesia. He came to Houston after completing his training uh, at Duke University and at Cleveland Clinic. Um, you know, Faisal is, uh, I like to think of him as a colleague and a friend, and he's a phenomenal teacher as well, having received numerous teaching awards, uh, as well as re receiving the prestigious Fulbright and Jaworski uh, Faculty Excellence Award in Educational Leadership. Uh, and, and I want to start off by thanking Faisal and the whole panel. Uh, I know some of you are literally just coming from the ICU to uh, the studio to, to do this uh, presentation. So we're really getting a very timely uh, uh, discussion uh, with regard to critical care management issues. And I think for all of us as, as cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, uh, you know, our roots are in critical care medicine. Although many of us haven't been doing it, I think it's a, this is a good opportunity for us to get back to our roots. So Faisal, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I'm gonna let you introduce the panel, but I just wanna give you a heartfelt uh, welcome and a thank you for uh, joining us today with Grand Rounds. Faisal? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shah. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, before I start, I want to remind the audience uh, that you can post questions at pollev.com slash Tabeki or text Tabeki to 37607 and we'll be happy to answer the question. Uh, before I begin, you know, it's very important in this day and age to have the right information. And since this is Tabeki Grand Round, I do like to quote Dr. Debeke's statement that good information is the best medicine. In this day and age of bombardment of infodemic, especially labeled by WHO with so much information that people don't know what is right and what is not so right. So infodemic is, is a challenge. This is a disease process which is only six months old and so many information is out there that it can be very confusing, especially for people who are not actively in the front line taking care of these patients in the intensive care units. I really want to dispel and stop the Google MD process and the WhatsApp MD. And I'm sure we all have been bombarded with everything from everywhere else. So it's imperative that we have the right information. Now, we are all very fortunate that on this panel we have people who are taking care of these patients as we speak and you know some of them were working last night and some of them are working today later on. So let's hear from the top expert who can really give you the accurate information to give you what's happening and not what's happening on the media, not what get, you're getting through WhatsApp or Google. So with that, I'd like to introduce my panelists. The first of all is Dr. Deepa Gutur, critical care specialist working in our medical intensive care unit. Welcome Deepa. Thank you. I have Dr. Daniela Moran. She's a pulmonary critical care specialist. She's working in our medical intensive care unit in the Houston Methodist Hospital. Welcome, Daniela. Thank you. And on Zoom, we have two of our own experts, Dr. Divina Tuazan. She's a pulmonary critical care specialist working in our cardiovascular Debeki Heart Center ICU. Welcome, Divina. Thank you. And I've got Dr. Stephen Shu also through Zoom, who's a critical care specialist working in our medical intensive care unit. So Thank with you. that introduction uh, you know I like to have the baton give to Dr. Gutur and she's gonna walk all of us so this team is gonna walk you through multiple issues multiple uh, you know topics and kind of give you a whole wrap around and that's very important and we'll be happy to take questions towards the end well then with that deep Dr. Gutur you have the forum 
Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you for uh, having us here today. Um, I'm going to be starting off uh, with the pathophysiology and the treatment uh, in terms of the medications. Um, and as we all know, I mean, coronavirus is actually an emerging infectious disease, uh, first observed in December uh, 2019 in the Hubei province in Wuhan, China. And since then, I mean, it's been, uh, it's spread all over the globe. Um, and uh, I'm sure everyone has seen the uh, John Hopkins um, uh, image of the, of the uh, map of the entire world. And uh, as of uh, 4 14, 2020, we have in, just in United States, about 600,000 patient, uh, 600,000 uh, people who have uh, confirmed positive, and about 25,000 uh, reported uh, deaths. So this is actually a very grim, uh, very, uh, very severe pandemic um, uh, that uh, that the uh, medical uh, field is uh, working uh, with. Um, and as always, um, you know, I mean, the main. Uh, the main objectives or the main idea, the way we took care of these patients when all this started was um, the first and foremost thing, which is protecting ourselves and the others, making sure that we follow the infection control, uh, et cetera, staying calm and keeping it simple. I mean, this has actually carried us through uh, very nicely uh, uh, up until uh, now. And, uh, and I'm sure this is going to be a marathon and uh, we are gonna continue uh, to, uh, to remember this mantra going forward. When it comes to actually the patient strategies uh, per se, um, um, the main uh, idea was to have early diagnostic testing and we've gone through uh, uh, difficulties initially where the testing had to be done in the state department and we were not able to get uh, early testing, which has actually changed now. and. Uh, um, Houston Methodist is able to get these early testing within four hours and that has actually this has been a, a game changer in, in fact for uh, caring for our patients um, uh, with COVID and uh, so early identification and mostly like the risk stratification is, is what uh, has uh, helped us to identify which patients belong to the ICU and non ICU um, especially in um, uh, a challenge with the resources, I mean, I think this was uh, uh, very important for us to have. Um, we came, uh, we put together specific protocols for lab work and treatment and ventilatory management, and I'll be talking about some of the lab work and some of the treatment uh, that we put together. And this was like kind of learning all over, I mean, like learning very new, uh, a very new disease process um, uh, from the beginning and from the get-go so it, it was quite challenging and post ICU care uh, it was also challenging uh, because uh, family were not uh, could not visit the uh, patients and uh, uh, psychosocial support for the families were actually very nicely provided with uh, with our virtual ICU and uh, we had daily communication so just a little background on uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes the uh, coronavirus disease, uh, 2019 uh, disease. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually has multiple proteins. Uh, the main uh, uh, S protein is the one that binds to uh, the ACE2 receptors and they are present on the alveolar type 2 cells. So they're in the lungs. Uh, they're pro I mean, they're probably in other uh, areas as well, inclu including brain, but majority of it is found in the alveolar type 2 cells. So once the S protein binds to the ACE2 receptor, uh, it gets, um, uh, uh, it kind of imaginates into the uh, alveolar type 2 cells and from, there, from then on uh, starts to reproduce the RNA replicates and then explodes the cell and, uh, and uh, uh, actually releases m uh, many, many more uh, viruses. Um, and uh, I know I was going to be talking to a cardiologist today, so I just uh, put together also uh, on, on, the, on the right hand side of the panel 
um, how the ACE, uh, what's the relationship between the ACE1 and then the ACE2. So ACE1, as we all know, is the uh, enzyme that converts the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Normally in patients with sepsis, um, this pathway, the uh, RAAS pathway, renin uh, angiotensin uh, pathway, gets activated and uh, this leads to acute lung injury, vasoconstriction, etc. Uh, patients who take uh, ACE inhibitors or um, ARB inhibitors, I mean, there is, uh, which blocks the ACE, uh, which blocks the enzyme ACE1, um, uh, it's possible that uh, they may upregulate the ACE2 uh, enzyme. And um, uh, so there are multiple preclinical studies that says um, either they upregulate or they downregulate. So that's still not very clear. Um, and it's uh, also very interesting that uh, the ACE2 positive cells are uh, much higher in uh, Asian population when compared to um, when compared to uh, African or uh, white population. So, uh, so at this uh, at this time, actually, there is uh, not a clear recommendation whether to control uh, whether to hold the ACE and ARB inhibitors or. Uh, uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, um, but uh, I think more uh, clinical studies are, uh, are needed. So this is the image of um, the, uh, uh, the proteins that are on the membrane, the S protein that we talked about that helps in attaching or binding to the ACE2, uh, ACE2 uh, receptors, and uh, there are uh, M protein that help, in, um, uh, that help the virus to uh, take in, um, uh, take in um, um, nutrients. Uh, there are other enzymes called, I mean, sorry, the, there are other proteins called the N and the E protein, and they're very crucial in activating the cytokine release syndrome, and we're going to talk about it in uh, just, uh, just a few minutes. So uh, it, to summarize, actually, there are a few hypothesized phases of the COVID-19 infection. Um, there is an initial viral phase there where there is a uh, number, uh, I mean, there is viral replication followed by stage two, which is a pulmonary phase, and that is followed by the hyperinflammatory phase or the cytokine release phase. Uh, and there are various uh, clinical uh, sy uh, symptoms that's associated with it, um, but uh, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to make sure that we understand which phase a patient's presenting to you and to which treatment options uh, that we can choose. Some of the blood work or the laboratory uh, data that we uh, try to get uh, pretty much every day is other than the basic labs, we also monitor their coagulation panel, their inflammatory markers, which is a key thing like the CRP, the ferritin, uh, interleukin-6, and LDH. Um, and, um, uh, and we also look at G6PD levels for patients who are on hydroxychloroquine uh, just in case um, uh, I mean, uh, because it uh, it causes hemolysis if they uh, if they do get it. So, um, and triglyceride levels they're usually elevated. But these are some of the lab data that we uh, request. Uh, here, I mean, I just put together like the rapid progression of um, of this um, uh, COVID-19 disease. It's m most, I mean, I cannot say it's mostly respiratory disease, but that's the first uh, thing that we notice. I mean, uh, there is uh, there are other multi-organ involvement as well, but uh, uh, the lung seems to be uh, hit the hardest uh, with uh, severe ARDS and. Um, and uh, moving on to uh, the treatment, I mean, uh, I have to caution everybody here that there is no proven or approved treatment for COVID-19. And uh, we are using, um, uh, we are using treatments that have worked in the past for different uh, indications and, uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and we are able to support the patient's organs and uh, we, are, um, uh, we are moving forward. Uh, here is uh, the pharmacologic treatments of COVID-19, exactly where each of the, um, each of the said uh, treatment acts. Um, so the hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine uh, prevents, uh, uh, prevents from the uh, fusion of the membrane uh, with the um, uh, fusion of the membrane with um, um, uh, of the virus. 
and uh, as well as uh, once the virus is inside, I mean there is RNA replication, and the um, and the virus uh, and the uh, antiviral agents like the lopinavir, ritonavir, as well as the remdesivir, they prevent from the RNA replication uh, as well. And then we have other um, um, medications like uh, tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor uh, that prevents the cytokine release once um, uh, uh, once the uh, body kind of re responds with the uh, hyperinflammatory uh, response. Um, so in the past, lopinavir and ritonavir has been studied in, uh, in the prior SARS uh, ARDS, um, and uh, it has shown to uh, have cytopathic effects on, on the SARS coronavirus. And uh, this, is, um, uh, uh, this is a paper that was uh, released in 2004 where they looked at different uh, dosages and apparently four mics per, uh, for, uh, per mil was the inhibitory dose. So taking that and moving forward with the, um, with the, um, uh, the COVID-19 disease, uh, this is the, um, the randomized control trial uh, that was um, uh, published in New England Journal very, uh, very recently. Uh, really that didn't show any difference between the control and the lo uh, lopinavir, ritonavir uh, in terms of uh, improvement uh, from COVID-19. Currently, we have uh, remdesivir uh, trials ongoing. Uh, they are also randomized uh, trials. Um, initially, we had been using it for uh, compassionate use, um, and um, now currently we are using it for moderate to severe um, uh, patients uh, and uh, mostly for patients who are not actually not intubated. So we are trying to use remdesivir early. This is a drug that was initially uh, identified for, uh, in fact, uh, Ebola and hantavirus as well. And uh, this medication actually mimics adenosine and uh, inappropriately goes into the viral RNA and halts the RNA replication. Um, so uh, there was also a recent trial which was um, looking at the data of all the patients who got compassionate use of remdesivir and then they looked at whether there was any improvement, any cumulative uh, clinical improvement um, uh, with, uh, for these patients. And um, because it's not a randomized controlled trial, it it's uh, it's very hard pressed to accept this amount of uh, improvement. And again, uh, the final randomized trial is going to actually answer uh, answer us um, um, uh, better. Um, and. Um, Actually, I mean, this. Uh, uh, there were, I think, 61 patients, out of which 53 patients uh, had uh, full data that was collected, and uh, it really did show some clinical improvement. But, uh, uh, but again, we are not, we are, we don't have a comparator here, so I'm not sure uh, uh, how best to use this information uh, at this time. Uh, convalescent serum has been used in the past. I mean, in fact, it's been used in um, uh, in the bird flu or about a hundred years ago as well. Um, but uh, uh, there was there was a small trial in China um, of uh, five patients and uh, who received this convalescent serum as well as uh, antiviral and uh, uh, and steroids, and uh, they showed improvement in ARDS in terms of its resolution. Um, our HMH data, I mean, uh, the Houston Methodist Hospital was one of the number one in the country to actually use this convalescent serum. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Alex, uh, Dr. Eric Salazar and, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Mazur um, uh, came up with this, and uh, so far we have about 27 patients who've received it. Six people have been discharged, um, and um, uh, and uh, some of the patients, we've prevented them from getting intubated. Some have uh, been ex successfully extubated uh, as well. So, uh, and again, I mean, the data is too early to analyze uh, at this time, and um, um, uh, it, it will be updated, I'm sure, and uh, it's uh, sounding very hopeful uh, at this time. 
Um, so we talked about the viral phase and uh, the remdesivir, the antiviral, the convalescent serum uh, very nicely that can be used in the early phases. Um, what happens in the inflammatory phase though is the cytokine release syndrome. Uh, so you can see in this uh, picture, you see a, a picture of an alveolus and uh, once, uh, once the virus attaches to the type 2 uh, alveolar uh, cells um, and, uh, and it releases more viruses, it actually also stimulates the granulocytes, the neutrophils, and the dendritic cells to actually uh, release a cascade of these cytokines and chemokines. And these attract more T cells, and um, those T cells um, uh, causes further uh, inflammatory process and further release of, uh, of these uh, cytokines. So uh, this attacks other organs, uh, causes multi-organ uh, uh, multi uh, failure, and, um, and, uh, and definitely ARDS. So, uh, uh, Dr. Moran is going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of how ARDS, uh, ARDS happens, but uh, um, uh, it seems to be that the cytokine release has a major role to play in that. Um, we have uh, a, a lot of experience using uh, the IL-6 inhibitor, um, the tocilizumab. The IL-6 is one of the key players along with IL-1 and uh, TNF. and um, um, and as well as angiopoietin 2. Uh, but uh, we have IL-6 blockade um, uh, and we have uh, used IL-1 blockade as well and it, uh, um, in, in order to control or, uh, or uh, in fact prevent from uh, cytokine uh, storm from, uh, from happening. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, thing about the use of anticoagulation uh, in uh, patients with uh, COVID-19. Uh, yes, we monitor PT, PTT, and fibrinogen as well as D-dimer. We have seen very, very elevated D-dimer levels across the board in these patients. Uh, however, at this time, the ASH guidelines uh, uh, recommends that we use uh, Lovenox, um, 40 milligrams for prophylaxis and 30 milligrams in renal patients. And, um, and there is no... Um, they do not routinely uh, recommend for uh, a higher uh, level of uh, um, uh, anticoagulation unless it's needed as in uh, venous thrombosis uh, as in uh, venous thrombosis we also formed a, a, a group uh, where we put together and uh, uh, put together uh, the SARS-CoV-2 treatment algorithm. Uh, what uh, what do we do when the patients are not intubated? Uh, they are on the floor. How do we start off uh, with the with the treatment? Uh, and this was actually a, a wonderful um, experience uh, 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 with a group of people from hematology, from uh, infectious disease, from uh, intensive of care, I mean critical care medication, uh, critical care team, uh, and we put together um, uh, uh, this um this algorithm and it's uh, in in order to also kind of standardize this across the uh, across the board, and um, and with that I want to pass on um, the, uh, pass on the remote to uh, uh, Dr. Moran. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. As Again, as a uh, first-line physician uh, taking care of these patients, actually I had the opportunity to admit the first patient here at the Methodist uh, Hospital, um, actually the first two patients coming with um, with uh, uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, we had the opportunity to, uh, to triage the patients and to create all these protocols uh, to treat the patients. But we know uh, about 80% of patients with infections are mostly asymptomatic or mild. We are concentrating mostly on the patients which are hospitalized. And out of these hospitalized patients, about 25% uh, uh, they do develop uh, severe uh, mm, uh, uh, hypoxemic, uh, uh, respiratory failure and uh, ARDS and uh, in general uh, patients in the ICU per uh, previous data we have about 42 uh, percent that require uh, uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, mechanical ventilation <coughs> and ECMO <coughs> and in the next few minutes I have reserved I'm going to focus a little bit on on that part. Um, as Deepa mentioned uh, usually patients present maybe with indolent symptoms fever cough but then you could see a rapid and 
subsequent uh, progression and a notice on the x-ray, also on the CT. Uh, this is some data uh, from surviving sepsis campaign. These are case reports from uh, coming from China, where actually show the epidemiologically patients with uh, uh, severe uh, respiratory failure, with shock and cardiogenic injury, they have higher case uh, uh, fatality rate. Um, uh, part of complications we see in uh, ICU, uh, multiple uh, acute kidney failure, uh, a lot of patients actually would require uh, renal replacement therapy, abnormal LFTs, uh, cardiac injury, which is uh, pretty significant, and um, uh, <coughs> sepsis, septic shock uh, from uh, d uh, data from China, about 40% uh, 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 of patients which unfortunately died while in the ICU, they do have uh, some type of uh, uh, shock, and specifically septic shock and multi-organ failure, and uh, encephalopathy, and uh, thrombosis, uh, some thrombotic complications. Very rarely uh, notice barotrauma or secondary pneumonia. I just want to point out uh, this uh, study from Netherlands where despite of using appropriate uh, um, uh, prophylaxis for anticoagulation uh, with anticoagulation patients in the ICU, uh, over 30% they did develop some type of a thrombosis, both venous and arterial, and uh, the mechanism was postulated to be uh, due to inflammation, prolonged mobilization, hypoxia, and uh, some diffuse intravascular coagulation. There are centers which are um, pushing towards um, um, anticoagulation, um, uh, we're working on a, on a final protocol, but for now the final recommendations are to be aggressive to do uh, uh, DVT prophylaxis and monitor closely for, for uh, signs of uh, thrombosis. Um, what are the risk factors which, uh, which can make the patients develop a more severe illness? Um, I separate them in epidemiologically, and, and there is a lot of data now coming out from, um, from uh, Europe and now United States where um, morbid obesity plays a significant role, also diabetes and specifically uncontrolled diabetes. Usually uh, we see patients with hemoglobin IC over seven, eight, 11, and other, other comorbidities like immunosuppression and chronic kidney disease. Also when the patients, they present hypoxic or dyspneic, um, they are at high risk to develop severe illness. And also there are some lab data which could uh, actually suggest that patients may develop uh, significant uh, illness, uh, sp specifically inflammatory markers. Uh, elevated CPK, uh, renal failure. Uh, this is some uh, data from uh, uh, China, uh, actually one of the first early articles where it actually sh uh, separate patients from survivor and non-survivor and uh, patients with significant comorbidities uh, presenting with uh, um, cardiac uh, uh, dysfunction, kidney injury, uh, patients uh, requiring uh, ventilatory uh, support, uh, they were part of the non-survivor. Uh, in, this, in this article, 97% of patients from the non-survivor, they, they do, did require mechanical ventilation, also require renal replacement therapy. Now, um, when we talk about respiratory failure, there are multiple challenges, and uh, I'm sure everybody and all the doctors uh, from ICU and non-ICU taking care of the patients, they deal with this, specifically aerosol generating procedures. Uh, when should we intubate the patients? When should we extubate the patients? When should we use high-flow nasal cannula? When should we use non-invasive ventilation? Should we do bronchos bronchoscopies? Should we do tracheostomy? What do we do inflammatory markers? and we're trying to provide a guide and actually we try to protocolize all uh, the management of the patients and I'm going to touch a little bit on that. Um, specifically, we want to prevent uh, aerosolization because uh, we, we want to prevent uh, healthcare worker exposure. And uh, recent data uh, presented is about 9,000 patients in, uh, I'm sorry, 9,000 healthcare workers in the United States are uh, positive uh, COVID-19, out of which 27 died. Um, and uh, out of the ones which died, about uh, 10 of them were 65 years and older. 
a, a large majority, more than half of them, they were specifically in working in units which are treating only COVID-19 patients. And uh, the data uh, apparently is uh, relatively low just because the testing, uh, it was not uh, uh, given um, uh, hospital-wide. And the reports are that probably out of the uh, patients with COVID-19, about 3 to 11 percent are healthcare workers. Uh, the good news are uh, most of them, they don't require hospitalization. Um, now, what do we do for protection? Uh, recommendations are uh, for airborne precautions, airborne uh, isolation, specifically in negative pressure rooms, specifically when we do um, uh, aerosolization type of uh, procedures and we use uh, uh, personal protective equipment, N95. In Europe, they have this FFP2, the filtering face based uh, particles, and uh, using a, a powerful, powered air purifying respirator. And this is uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Gautour, doing a bronchoscopy on a patient in ECMO using the PAPR. Um, uh, a, a big issue with, uh, I think, any physician taking care of patients with COVID-19 is when should we intubate the patients. And uh, um, uh, some experts initially, they recommended early intubation, but I think right now mostly our focus is to uh, probably uh, prevent intubation, concentrate on treating with non-invasive uh, ventilation support, high flow nasal cannula, which they may be associated with aerosolization of particles, and there are some way we recommend and to, to protect ourselves. And, but also keep in mind the delaying of intubation until patient uh, uh, decompensates is harmful. So in general, uh, what should we do? When should we intubate the patients? When we have a rapid progression of respiratory distress, when uh, patients are not improving, when uh, they're being on a high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation, when they require high FiO2, uh, when hypercapnia gets worse, and of course when you have uh, hemodynamic instability, multi-organ failure, uh, ultramental status, unable to protect airways. Um, this is a very nice uh, guideline from uh, the surviving sepsis campaign where patients with hypoxemia, there'll be triage, do they need intubation? If we do it, we should do it in, um, in a protective manner. In uh, with a negative pressure room, we should use uh, an expert team uh, to do the intubation. And specifically, uh, the recommendations are, if possible, to do video laryngoscope. If the patients, they do not require major intubation, probably we should try supplemental oxygen. If they do well, continue to monitor. If they don't uh, do well, probably try uh, high flow nasal cannula or, um, or uh, non-invasive ventilation support, and, uh, and again, um, uh, do not delay intubation if, uh, if needed. But uh, our experience so far show that with use of uh, non-invasive ventilation, we were able to preserve and uh, be able to prevent some patients from even move, uh, to be moved out, uh, to be moved in the intensive care unit. Um, about non-invasive ventilation, again, is considered an aerosol generating procedure. Um, uh, usually before using non-invasive ventilation, try to use, if possible, high flow nasal cannula. Um, in case uh, that we need to use non-invasive ventilation, the recommendations are possible to use a full face mask. Um, now we are using uh, uh, more often the helmet, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, again, it's a little bit challenging. There are studies in the past showing that there were improvement in, uh, in morbidity in some patients. Um, Europe has uh, more experience with that, uh, but when we use um, uh, non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation, uh, we also could use some other ways to uh, to protect ourselves, to protect the healthcare workers with isolation tents. Uh, there are also uh, recommendations patients could uh, use uh, on top of a surgical mask. Um, we, uh, as a team, uh, pulmonary and then uh, the ICU physician, we uh, did uh, came together. Actually, this is uh, probably version number three of uh, mechanical ventilation COVID patients. It's a very busy slide. Hopefully, it'll be available for you. Um, but uh, we noticed that there are uh, two type of major phenotypes uh, in uh, ARDS on in patients with uh, severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, and for. 
for lack of time, I'm just going to be very short, but uh, here you can see uh, uh, Gattinoni mentioned uh, the L-type uh, and the uh, H-type, and specifically for the L-type, uh, is as uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Dalla, mentions, low everything, low elastans, low uh, VQ matching, uh, low lung weight, uh, versus, uh, and those are the type of people, you, you patients you will see with very high compliance, uh, versus the H-type, where you have everything high, high elastans, high uh, recruitability, they require high PEEP, and uh, high right to left shunting. And again, these are the patients with low compliance where you kind of have to follow ARDS and that type of, uh, of management where you want to make sure you keep the plateau pressure less than 30, uh, the driving pressure less than 15, and, and uh, recommendations are to use the PV loop for um, uh, uh, assessing what will be uh, the recruitability of the lung and uh, the valuable PEEP. Uh, to treat these patients, and uh, there is a link in the in the right uh, lower corner where it can uh, take you to uh, YouTube, where you'll be able to uh, to see how to recruit uh, the lungs and use the PV loop as a tool to assist you to assessing the optimal PEEP. And uh, probably in a later time, later discussion, we'll discuss more of the mechanism of the RDS and how do you treat. Now. Um, an important tool we use in the ICU, uh, specifically in our intubated, ventilated patients, hypoxemic, is the proning, and, and specifically manual proning. And, um, and over here on the bottom, I, there is a video um, with, uh, w as an education tool uh, to see how manual proning can be performed was, uh, uh, was performed here in our HMH hospital. Uh, but when should we do proning? Actually, uh, in early onset of ARDS, try to consider it early. If uh, patients are optimized on the ventilator, sedated, and they don't do well, uh, they require more than 60% of IO2, the PEEP is higher than 5. And, uh, and in some instances, we discover that the patients probably, they will not require ECMO if we do uh, uh, early proning. Uh, but uh, ECMO is another option. My colleague, uh, Dr. Toison, is going to mention about it. Uh, there are some studies in the past, not with the COVID-19 patients, where uh, uh, both proning and ECMO, they used uh, together, proning before ECMO, and uh, they all showed relatively good uh, data. Um, now, another important topic, of course, is liberation from mechanical ventilation. I'm not going to uh, stress on these guidelines. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, I do recommend to uh, follow SAT and SBT daily. Um, and why we created a respiratory winning score where it looks not only at ventilatory mechanics but also the clinical data, and specifically at hemodynamic status, uh, fever, uh, mental status, and again, because we want to prevent patients to become hypoxic, requiring high flow oxygen and non invasive ventilation, uh, to look also at FiO2 and uh, PEEP requirements. This is not a validated score. Um, um, I recommend to use it as a clinical guidance. Um, now, what did we learn from other, other places, um, China, Italy, and New York? Um, um, these are specifically uh, uh, from ICU physicians, mostly in northern Italy, uh, about to be flexible. They had uh, the difficulty time that probably they were not so prepared, and it felt for them that it was probably a wartime mentality. They had to deal with an exponential increase in patients with very limited uh, support, uh, very limited capabilities. They described that their ICU ICU bed requirements went from uh, uh, a number to exponentially to uh, 10 times more, and they had to work on rationing of the ICU beds, and also because they had to go uh, so high in the ICU bed requirements, their quality was decreased, and they, they uh, focused more on non-invasive ventilation, specifically CPAP, to prevent patients to require ICU care and invasive ventilation. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Moran. Then we're going to go to Dr. Tuazan. Uh, she's available by Zoom. Uh, Dr. Tuazan, do you want to share your, your, um, you know, your portion of contribution, especially related to the ECMO? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Hold on. 
when you're having a little technical difficulty. All right. Uh, if you want to wait, we can always go to Dr. Stephen Chu uh, while uh, Dr. Tuazan. Um, all right, we have. Okay, good. We have Dr. Tuazan's thing. All right, go ahead, Dr. Tuazan. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I would like to share our experience on ECMO support in COVID 19 patients in H. &H. <clears throat> so, as you all know, majority, if not all, of ICU admissions with COVID 19 patients are due to hypoxic respiratory failure requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. A proportion of these patients will fail or eventually fail maximal therapy. Fortunate enough, only a small proportion and may require, eventually require extracorporeal extra membrane oxygenation or as we call ECMO support. As the COVID-19 pandemic has evolved, there has been a steady increase in ECMO use. In this particular setting, provision of ECMO may be challenging in every institution from both resource and ethical standpoint. There may be a necessity to balance the need to provide high quality ECMO care to those who may benefit the most, acknowledging this is a finite resource and at the same time maintaining an environment of safety for both patient and staff. There are several studies showing that um, ECMO actually has poor outcome in patients with COVID-19. This is one of them that came out of the Journal of Critical Care saying that um, there's poor survival in ARDS due to coronavirus, but this is a full analysis of early reports and all of them in China. And um, this actually showed that among 234 AD ARDS patients, 17 underwent ECMO and the, their mortality rate was 94.1% as against to 70.9% in conventional therapy patients. So their mortality rate on ECMO is relatively high. And here is another study that came out in, from Shanghai, China, with um, mentioning ECMO support in COVID-19. This one mentioned eight of the COVID-19 patients received ECMO support with seven using VV and one using VA during CPR. Now, I saw the printing of this article in March 25th. Four patients died with a 50% mortality, three patients with 37.5% successfully weaned off ECMO after 22, 40, and 40 days support respectively, but remains on the mechanical ventilator. One of them is still on VB ECMO on the mechanical ventilator. And this one was an earlier, um, earlier article from um, the JAMA, which says that the role of ECMO in the management of COVID-19 is unclear at this point. So are there very various school of thought regarding the use of ECMO? So there's not just enough high quality evidence to guide ECMO practice in patients with COVID-19. Thus at HMH, our practice selection and decision making are based on evidence and experience from our previous infectious disease outbreaks. Our current best practice guidance or our own, um, our own ECMO committee um, that has come up with the inclusion exclusion criteria and a consensus opinion from the ECMO team. However, what we notice that is clear is there's increased mortality with increasing age and comorbidities, such as hypertension, diabetes, and cardiomyopathy. Therefore, early on during our discussion in the ECMO task force, we are cognizant of the fact that during a pandemic with limited capacity to, over, to offer this resource intensive mode of support, there is the potential for the selection criteria to become more stringent in order to offer this resource for those most likely to benefit and return to an acceptable quality of life. So we did not alter our inclusion exclusion criteria for our VB ECMO. And so we, we 
followed our own um, criteria that was revised by the ECMO committee as of January of 2020. Now, being a novel virus, our understanding of ARDS and COVID-19 is still evolving. And mind you, there's ongoing conversation and discussion even in our, um, in our system hospitals on, on the best mechanical ventilation strategy as opposed to the, um, against the atypical nature of ARDS, as they have mentioned earlier regarding the phenotype L and the phenotype H. However, we all know that mechanical ventila ventilation and the management of such prior to BV ECMO initiation plays a significant role on outcomes of our patients. Therefore, prior to consideration of ECMO, we recommend maximizing traditional therapy for, for ARDS in COVID-19 patients, including prone positioning and the use of flow lamp. So we have come up with an ECMO guide for COVID-19 patients in HMH. So this may look busy to you, so I'm gonna break it down. Mm -hmm. So this is our guide in itself. So when the patients are in a mechanical ventilator, we recommend prone positioning. When the patient has contraindication to prone positioning, then the patient is placed on an ECMO watch especially if the PF ratio is less than 50. If there's no contraindication, then the patient will go on proning and we have a certain proning protocol. And I will show you that um, our team also has a whole set of contraindications for um, proning. And then if the oxygenation improves in proning, and then they continue the current regimen. However, if the proning is not showing any benefit to the patient, then the patient is placed on ECMO watch. And so the ECMO watch, um, basically that means uh, these are patients who are pot with a potential to be placed on ECMO. And so when there's an ECMO watch, the ECMO resource is called. Basically, th this means either um, um, the intensivist in virtual ICU or the intensivist in one of the ICUs, the CV intensivist gets called and notified. And then the ECMO team is activated. The ECMO team consists of CV intensivists, CV surgeons, and the ECMO specialists. The ECMO specialists mainly to help, um, to help with uh, monitoring the patients while on the ECMO watch. Now, when the patient meets criteria for the inclusion and exclusion, which I will show you later on, then the perfusionist, the ECMO specialist, the surgeons, and everybody is notified in preparation for ECMO, ECMO insertion. If not, then we continue with the current critical care regimen or even escalate accordingly. And then afterwards, if the patient is going to be cannulated, the perfusionist and the ECMO specialist will gather the supplies then everybody prepares to um, put on their appropriate PPEs prior to the insertion, and then the patient is cannulated in the room. I will show you a video of that later on. Mm. Now, after the patient is cannulated and on ECMO support already, the CV intensivists are the ones who manage the ECMO. The other um, critical care specialists, such as the medical intensivists, and in our in our HMH, we have even the surgical liver intensivists, the neuro intensivists, the um, CC intensivists, all help with managing the patients to continue with the appropriate critical care management. The each patient on ECMO has an ECMO specialist who is monitoring them with one to four ratio and also a, um, an ECMO, ECMO nurse with a one-to-one -one ratio and a perfusionist who comes by and help out. Now the, um, the ECMO specialist will report to the CV intensivist for any issues in management. And then the ECMO team will assess the benefit of ECMO at regular intervals. There's also an automatic consult to the ethics team and the palliative care team and their family meetings that are conducted on a regular basis to provide update and to discuss prognosis with the family members. You will see on the right-hand side, there's a, um, a picture 
of how the virtual intensivist will work. And I will show you in the video as well, um, how that works for us. This is the ECMO inclusion and exclusion criteria that was passed in our ECMO um, CMPI this last January of 2020. Now for the ECMO resource, look at the bottom lower part of the screen. You, we, the physicians will call the CV intensivists. As of right now, all the ECMO patients are stationed in the Walter Tower 11. So either the CV intensivists in Walter Tower 11 or the CV intensivists in virtual ICU. All the other system hospitals will call Dr. McGillivray, who is our um, division chief for cardiothoracic and cardiovascular surgery. And, um, and then he will forward the information to the rest of the ECMO team. Now, this is the contraindications for proning. And below is the mechanical ventilatory guidelines. And, as, and mind you, even our own hospital and the rest of the system hospitals are still um, discussing this mechanical ventilatory guidelines. So this is um, Dr. Suarez preparing the equipment. He's our CD surgeon for primary candidate technician. We have an ECMO card. This card is a station outside of the room before the patient goes to the Gloves and gown, obviously. Probe cover. We have an ultrasound in the room, which we'll show you as well as well as the uh, the uh, pump device itself. The people in the room now are going to be myself, we, and Gil. And for specialists will be outside. The nurse will be inside as well. Like I said, then we'll take a video of it. Now this is in the ante room prior to entering the actual patient room where they all done and doff. And so this is the PPE that they use for prior to the insertion of ECMO. This is even prior to the placement of the sterile, the sterile um, gowns and the sterile gloves. Now this is the amount of personnel in a room. The usual, um, or not the usual, ELSO guidelines had recommended six personnel. We tried to limit it to only four. So we have the surgeon on the left-hand side with the, um, with the sterile gowns, and there's an assistant as well, the physician assistant. And the one in the middle is the perfusionist, and the one on the right-hand side is the nurse, the person, the patient's nurse. And the, the ultrasound machine is in there. And then the monitor, I want you to pay attention to the monitor. The O2 sat right now is 85. The patient's hemodynamically unstable, but that will change later on after the ECMO is placed. Now, this is while performing the procedure. I want you to pay attention all to the left-hand side where the monitor is, that's the virtual ICU, where we're all watching from outside. And then, Despite this very um, intense procedure and needing all these gowns and all these PPEs, we want to make sure the patient is safe, so we use the ultrasound as well. Like usual, we usually do in our patients who are needing vascular access. Now this is when the ECMO is already being connected. So the, 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 the whole procedure remains there all the whole time. And everybody looks at the monitor just as the perfusionist is now going to turn on the machine to note the improvement. And this is what you will see as the ECMO flow has been increased to five liters. We give the albumin on the left hand side if you will notice over there. And then the patient stabilizes. From 83 to 84% earlier, 
the older side is now 100%, and from the blood pressure being in the 80s earlier, now the blood pressure stabilizes, the heart stabilizes. So that's the placement of the ECMO. Then afterwards, after, of course, we continue with patient management while on the ECMO. We continue with lung protective therapy. We continue with the um, anticoagulation protocol. And in HMH, we have a pharmacy-driven monitoring and dose management. We use blood products judiciously due to the shortage in a pandemic situation. We start enteral nutrition within 48 hours and advancing it within the next three to five days. And we still continue with the disease modifying agents as mentioned earlier by doctors Gautour and Dr. Moran. And of course, at this point, it, early mobilization is not feasible and basically impossible, mainly because of the viral transmission. And there's going to be frequent ECMO device monitoring by the intensivists, the ECMO nurse, the ECMO specialist, with help from the perfusionist to verify device function and identify complications early. For procedures while in ECMO, this is going to be limited as much as possible. Bronchoscopy can be performed only if it can provide diagnostic and therapeutic benefit to the patient with use of appropriate PPE, which doctor, um, there's other, um, other devices that Dr. Shu will show you later on. For cutaneous tracheostomy should be performed only after careful consideration of risk benefit ratio, and preferably only when the patient is ready to transfer to another level of care. So definitely we try not to do this while the patient is on ECMO. So we have um, an email being sent out to the ECMO team regarding all the patients that we have and also regarding the equipment that we have. So this is as of yesterday, we have COVID-19, 11 COVID-19 patients requiring ECMO. Now we are housing them all in one ICU where the CB intensivists are working mostly in Walter Tower 11. Previously, they were located in the medical ICU where the CB intensivists will manage the ECMO and the, our medical um, intensivist colleagues will manage all other critical care issues. So it's a collaboration. Currently, as of yesterday, we have four patients on VV ECMO still. Among the total of 11 patients that were positive and placed on ECMO, one of them were placed in Willowbrook, another one was placed in Sugarland, but six have been successfully decannulated now, with four still ongoing. But um, unfortunately, one patient was placed in hospice and expired due to a complication. The perfusionists provide information and available ECMO equipment, like I said, like I said earlier. Now, um, because of the limitation with the ECMO nurses, Medical ICU and the Walter Tower 11 have trained their nurses to staff for ECMO patients in partnership with an ECMO specialist or perfusionist who are available at all times in the unit. The Walter Tower 11 team will provide a nurse to manage the ECMO patients each shift, and if unavailable, then they will request assistance from the CVICU team, which is located in Walter Tower 9. So I'm going to show you our preliminary data on all those 11 patients. Like I mentioned, there are a total of 11 patients. Six have been successfully decannulated, and one had been put in hospice and expired. And currently, we still have four in the Walter Tower ongoing. So among all of these 11 patients, if you notice, we, don't, we have um, limited cannulation to less than seven years old. So we have two who are more than 65 and one is 68 and one is 67, but majority of them are between 40 and 60 years old. And um, on the right-hand side, you will see that nine of them were cannulated in HMH, one in Willowbrook, and another one in Sugarland. Now, from the days of admission prior, to, uh, days presenting with symptoms prior to admission, most of them have been um, between two days to a week prior to admission, and two had been three weeks prior to admission having the symptoms. And these are the symptoms that they presented with, which is the typical of um, a viral infection, cough, fever, 
shortness of breath, which is very particular with COVID-19, diarrhea, vomiting, and um, um, fever, of course, hypotension, and the rest. The comorbidities that we have noted with patients who we had to place on ECMO are diabetes, so, but, and hypertension. None of them had cardiomyopathy. But if you notice, even only four of them had diabetes and only five had hypertension. Now, in terms of length of stay between the day of admission and initial intubation, they, most of them are intubated within the first three days because that's how they presented with respiratory symptoms. And only one presented uh, had to be intubated within four days after admission. Among all of this, only one had underwent tracheostomy, nine are still intubated, one actually, you know, ten, eight has been intubated, and then one had expired, and then one actually had been um, extubated and placed in an heated um, high flow nasal cannula. I apologize, nine intubated, one um, tracheostomized, one on he who is on heated high flow um, oxygen and one that expired. So for the days between initial admission and ECMO insertion, we would not, we would prefer not to place ECMOs on patients who've been ventilated more than eight days on the mechan, more than eight days on high support. So most of these patients actually had been ventilated less than seven days, because if you notice the days between initial admission and ECMO exertion were a total of eight days. And our run times are usually between three to seven days compared to the study that I had showed you earlier. Their run times are very, very long in the 40s. Ours is only um, three to seven days. And one is the one, um, there's only one who um, had a run time of 13 days, which is one um, on seven, more than seven days. And currently four are still in ECMO, but, but still less than a week. Now, majority of these patients have been prone. Three had complications with proning and thus went on ECMO. Five had been on CRT and six did not, but had also um, complications of AKI. All of them are investigation medications. Um, and uh, for the complications, actually this is not accurate as of yet because we have been noticing more and more of the toxic encephalopathy, especially after they have been more awake because majority of them had been um, deeply sedated, but they have been more awake and we notice more and more of this encephalopathy. And then for the AKI, they're actually, almost all of them have AKI. The one who expired is the one who had intracranial hemorrhage. And majority of our patients have septic shock as well. And so if you see here, patients who are in pressors, some of them are in pressors, only four are not. And all of them are deeply sedated. So we don't see the encephalopathy until later. In, ter in terms of discharge disposition, one had expired. One has been transferred to LTAC. Nine, nine are still admitted in hospital in the acute care setting. And for um, our overall ECMO status, we have six patients who have successfully decannulated and that um, relates to 54%. Four are still ongoing, which is 36%, and one expired out of the 11, which is 9%. So it is a very small number, but I think we have promising results compared to the previous, um, previous data. But of course, we have learned from, from them as well, from, um, and we have been giving more of the investigational drugs to our medic to our patient population, and that is it. Uh, is the Dr. Shu? Stephen? Yeah. So we're going to go to Dr. Stephen Shu now. And uh, we'll wait for him to get connected through Zoom. And so we can, I know we're going a little bit over time than usual, but I think those topics and these things are very relevant for, for the broader audience. So it's very important to do that. So I think uh, Dr. Shu, you're on? Yes, yes. All right, go ahead, please. All right, so uh, I just wanted to run it quickly. Uh, so since this, um, I, I have the privilege to admit third and fourth patients and this uh, pandemic, 
uh, we're able to see uh, the, the rising and search use of PPE. So one of the big concerns we start to notice is that what are some of the ways we can cut the PPE usage? And as you can see here on the pictures, we have pretty much bring all the pumps, uh, ventilator, and even dialysis machine outside of the rooms. And, and this has sparked an idea uh, nationwide uh, from other hospitals as well. And also our nurses was actually smart enough uh, to really put together uh, a, a really nice uh, apparatus here, as you can see uh, with the stands here. And also we're using IV hooks to kind of lift the IV lines above the ground to prevent that infection uh, control concern. Uh, and also we have started using, uh, because all, a lot of the COVID patients is, uh, have high incidence of hyperglycemia, needing insulin drips. And the frequency of, imagine Q2 hours, going in and out of just taking finger sticks, that's 12 PPEs by itself. So we started using the um, non-invasive uh, way of uh, monitoring the glu uh, glucose outside of the rooms. And so by, just to give you a number, uh, we used at the beginning about 1,500 PPEs for a 20-bed, 24-bed ICU. And with just these measures alone, we're able to cut the PPE use to about 1,000. So we cut about a third. Uh, of their PPE use. And in terms of the room itself, we retrofitted um, quite a bit of the rooms into negative pressure capability. As you can see on the top left, there's that big vent going into the exhaust uh, that created partial, uh, PP, uh, partial negative pressure in the room. And in terms of intubation, the aerosolizing uh, procedures, as you can see with the ample bag, we've attached the filter. Um, for doing intubations and also for, we use disposable bronchoscopy. I also was the first one to perform the bronchoscopy. So we had to be pretty innovative about this uh, back then uh, before PAPR was uh, fully available. So as you can see, we use even a small plastic bag just to contain the tubing apparatus within the bag to prevent uh, aerosoli aerosolization from the procedure. And as you just, as was mentioned earlier, Dr. Couture is uh, performing the bronchoscopy here, and this is in the full, uh, full uh, PAPR setting. Um, in terms of the intubation itself, this is one of the most high-risk procedures of all. So we have uh, co come across a design from Taiwan used uh, called the aerosol box. And we come up with our own versions. As you can see top left, we have three different versions that we've been through. And we actually found a way to connect a uh, HEPA filter fitted vacuum pump as portable actually uh, to reduce the amount of floating aerosols uh, in, the, in the box itself. And as you can see, not only for intubations, but we're able to use for bronchoscopy. And also here's a, a, a picture of how they have used in Asia to even use for uh, the GI folks to do endoscopy. And on the far right here, as you can see uh, with Dr. Masood here, and this um, sort of mobile uh, anti-room uh, fitting box. Here, what we, we can actually use it to get to the patient without using extra PPEs and still provide the uh, protection to our staff in terms of uh, more for outpatient setting for sampling uh, and so forth. And this is the aerosol chamber and aerosol shield that uh, Dr. Moran has mentioned in the uh, in the in the ICU or even on the floor, so we could use around uh, on the patients in terms of uh, delivering, for example, uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So the aerosolization uh, risk has been reduced. And actually, currently Texas A and M has been working closely with us and trying to devise this uh, shields uh, to try to make it available for our patients. Uh, last but not least, uh, telemedicine, as Dr. Tozo mentioned extensively, uh, we started using you know, our, our first ECMO patients uh, collaborating from outside the room to inside the room. And also we have used the same uh, technology to reduce the, the amount of times we have to go in and out of the room to reduce the PPE use. So uh, also it really helps to not only uh, monitoring and managing the patients, but we're also able to uh, communicating and video conferencing with family members as well. I think that's uh, one of the key parts uh, to the technology is that they're able to see their loved ones as much as a horrible scene that there might be uh, a very emotional scene that we have uh, come across. Uh, but I think this still give a, a better way of uh, during this pandemic to have them visualize and able to communicate at the same time 
with the team and with their loved ones. Thank you. Dr. Shu, thank you for that uh, excellent uh, update on the, all the innovations. You know, it is fascinating how human ingenuity and the work from uh, nurses, from doctors, uh, from engineers have come across and kind of build up with that uh, administrative support and everything. So, and I can tell you that Dr. Shu has been a very creative, he has been very creative. He's added a lot of uh, energy and a lot of uh, new ideas and along with all of his team members. So uh, we're going to go with a couple of questions which have come up. Uh, the first question was, can you please share the workflow of inpatient COVID-19 patients within Houston Methodist or let us know. Dr. Gutur, you want to answer that? Yes, uh, there okay. is a web, uh, website. It was actually mentioned. Um, uh, um, it was actually mentioned, but yes, definitely we can, uh, we can share, um, share this. It's uh, basically, I think it's COVID-19, uh, you know, algorithm treatment and yeah. we'll send, send it out, it out. Uh, because there's again, a, it's a living and document and, you know, as the evidence is evolving, it has been updated. Absolutely. So there's a question, does the non-invasive positive pressure helmet limit aerosolization? Dr. Moran, you would like to answer that? It does not limit aerosolization, but it limits the exposure of the patients, the way it's designed. It limits the interface on the face. As you know, the face is irregular, so there is less leakage around the way that it's attached to, to the body. And, uh, and it's one way it had been tested, and apparently it's a limited uh, aerosolization around, around the interface. And uh, probably that would be one of the more useful ways to use. Um, if you need to use uh, non-invasive ventilation, you don't have the helmet, you can also use uh, the, the full face mask. And what we have here at the Methodist Hospital is called the performance mask. Actually, it's all around the face. And again, it's attached to an uh, expiratory filter. So. And I saw that you had, a, you had this uh, shield also or a cross that will allow you to cover the patient. The goal would be, as I mentioned, was uh, how to uh, minimize uh, uh, intubation, how to provide better oxygenation, and yet to provide healthcare safety. So as you can see, there are much more innovative devices which have been made along with our partnership with Texas A&M and NMED program and our RI and Dr. Sassman's and our team. So, and, and we look forward to Dr. Moran and his team to kind of add on that. So another question was, did you take care of any pregnant COVID-19 patients? I know that in our system hospital, they, they did take care of, of a pregnant patient and she delivered and she did get sick afterwards, but uh, she's recovered quite a bit. Uh, at the main campus, we don't, uh, we have not, but in our system hospital, they have. Uh, one more question, Dr. Shu, I'll ask you. Um, the question was, how to keep a resident technically trained in that pandemic? Any advice, is Dr. Stephen Shu, would you like to answer that? Yeah, so I think we use a graduating process. Uh, at the very beginning, we, uh, we did not allow the residents to go into the rooms and it was more attending only in terms of hands-on. However, after everyone's fitted for N95 and PAPR and our familiarity with the disease itself has increased, uh, we start to engage residents more. Not only from the, from the rounding uh, perspective, but starting from the bedside perspective. Uh, because COVID itself is a multidisciplinary approach is not only to touch the patients or to be in that room, but also is from the overall management uh, for ventilator, from ICU strategies and the communication with uh, multiple teams at the same time. And moreover is to uh, keep our family informed. So it, it's good to have the trainees to, to go through that process and be part of the team uh, to engage early, uh, early and take, take away the fear. I think that's the most important thing. So as you can see, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Shu, that uh, based on some of the data that we've seen in the Methodist Hospital system and main campus and other our, our partners all across, uh, you know, the, the outcomes are much better uh, compared to what we've seen in different parts of the world and different parts of the country. And I think it's kudos to our shared learning. It's kudos to the excellent work everybody's done. So i really like to, before I close, is to thank all the ICU nurses, all the respiratory therapists, physical therapists, pharmacy, uh, residents, fellows, uh, NMED, you know, PCAs, housekeeping, administration, supply chain, and those whom are forgetting. And not only that, but our colleagues, uh, the cardiologists, the surgeon, and everything who are actually managing 
our non-COVID ICU. So it's really a teamwork. I'm amazed and humbled by extra work everybody's done. And, in, and we'd like to thank. It is still ongoing and we will be you know, updating and modifying and really doing the best care for our city and everybody. With that, I thank you so much.